through our tonight sponsors. So if you need a dumpster, you need to talk to Mid-America Mid Dumpster Rental Services. I believe their website is Mid-America, no, kcdump.com, I believe that's it. Uh, if you need your houses cleaned out, or you need your Airbnbs cleaned out, or you just want your own home cleaned out, talk to the cleaning maids. They do all types of cleaning services. They even will clean out your hoarder houses. They also shampoo carpets, do some floor waxing. If you need funding, call KC Lynn. The guys over at KC Investor Rehab Loans, I should say guys and gals, we need have gals over there too. They also have wholesale houses, so check them out. Also within that group of people, they all work together as uh, PMI Property Management. They do property management for your regular rentals like you're used to forever. They also do short-term rentals, which is the new thing. Uh, Mark Yana, he's your guy you're going to see for cabinets and some flooring. And I believe he still has some really cool deals on gooseneck faucets, so check that out. North Oak Investment, if you need uh, short-term loans, talk to them. If you need help with your foundations, talk to Olson Foundation. And for those of you that are totally lost, what am I looking at on a foundation? They have tons and tons of videos explaining everything. So you can go get a foundation education off of their blogs. You need help with your accounting and bookkeeping and payroll, talk to Bob Coleman if he and his team can help you out. You need short-term funding and DSCR loans. Susan Aubin at Merchants Mortgage can help you out there. And if you need an attorney that can help in the bankruptcy area, estate planning, real estate law, and then a few other areas, you can talk to Spence Stover. And you can find all of these people on the business directory, plus all of our business members, which we have quite a few other business members in the room joining us tonight. A few faces we haven't seen for a while. They've been hiding out. But go to Mary.org, click on Business Directory. You'll find their names, their phone numbers, what they do, their websites. You can gather more information there. And we have a few announcements, and I still haven't fixed that slide. You should have on your seats, or you may have one on the seat next to you. We did every other one. We should have some meeting notes that you can check out. The top of that is telling you to grab the newsletter. You might have also got an email when you signed up that has a download of the newsletter. I have some physical copies here. It's, it's more of a business directory and a membership directory. But what we counted it up, there's like 75 links in here. If you read it digitally, the links work. So you don't have to go typey, 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 and then go, I spelled it wrong. Just click the link on the digital version and it'll take you right where you're going. Especially on the back page, because the business directory for all of our business members are in there as well, and all of their links, in theory, should work. All right, so what else is in there? Christmas meeting, the December meeting. How many people have been to our December meeting to Speed Network since COVID? What do we think? The big round circle sound is, is really cool. So we've di we discovered a new way of speed networking when we came back after COVID because we were still a little afraid of everybody getting right in front of everybody face to face really close. And then topping for 60 seconds at the top of their lungs and then switching seats. We're like, that just sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Let's put us all in a big circle so we are all, you know, 10 feet away, 15 feet away. Although we did show the microphone, so that might have been bad. But we did. We handed the microphone around. Everybody got their one pitch, their 60 seconds. Most people were done in 40. Some took two. Some of them got heckled because they forgot what to say. But we went around the circle with the microphone. Everybody went once. We'd always wanted to do it that way, but we didn't think it would work. We thought the COVID meeting would be smaller. It was not. And we got through the whole room in... A, a little under an hour and a half with like 100 people in the room. Everybody loved it. The gift basket followed the microphone and everybody put their business cards in it. We scanned all those in so you guys could take notes and then we emailed you everybody's business cards so you could contact the people you wanted to contact and it worked great. So we're doing that. The December meeting, which I believe is the second Tuesday of December, I think it's the ninth. There's one catch. 
to come to that meeting. There's no cost. You don't have to be a member. Anybody can come. But we're going to shake you down for a new unwrapped toy or a cash or credit donation to Toys for Tots. So that's what we asked for in December so that we can support Toys for Tots. And they are also hurting really right, uh, right now. I guess there was a hurricane and a lot of kids are needing help just replacing basic toys from the hurricane. I also want to, our speaker is going to have some great information, so you should have a flyer on your desk, on your desk, on your chair, or on the table at the back if you don't have one, that has a free course on it, tells you how to get it, I'm sure he'll tell you that. What else do we got coming up on our meeting notes? I need a meeting notes because I don't have one in front of me. I'm getting through all my announcements, I guess I should go through my slides. Yeah, we'll go through my slides, I'll catch up. But all the stuff I'm going to talk about is on the meeting notes there. <laughs> Newsletter, Christmas. So we have an event coming up. I've joined a coaching group of probably about 20 other RIA groups. So we're combining efforts to bring Zoom classes, Zoom workshops. So we have speakers from various RIAs and some national speakers in, joining in. And Darren is doing a class on December 9th, he's from Dayton, Ohio. I know Darren, he is a hard money lender, a note investor. He's been investing for a very long time. That is a very old picture, he's not 12 anymore. <laughs> Actually, I think he was 30 there too, but he is very young looking. Um, and he is gonna teach how to hire the right people and afford it in your business, so you're not doing it all by yourself. And so that workshop is on the calendar for December 9th. Also, check out how many how many people here in the room host a meeting. We've got Windbusters. It's on Wednesday, and they are physical. Bob Coleman has his meetings on Tuesday at the ACA Club in Overland Park. Brendan Pishney is uh, the president of Landlords of Johnson County. They meet on the first Wednesday at six. six. What, Matty Rhodes? Huh? What's your Matt Ross? Matt Ross. Matt Ross Community Center. Angel has a group that meets on Thursdays on Zoom. It's a haves and wants. So if you have something to offer, you come to her meeting and share. If you have something you need, you come to her meeting and ask. And they try to help everybody find each other. That's a virtual networking weekly on Thursdays. And what else? I uh, Britain isn't here anymore, but they have a meeting on the third Tuesday. It's kind of a whiteboard to sit down and talk about deals. Sometimes they have a speaker on a subject, but usually they're evaluating deals. And I think, I think I've got all of our meetings that we have. Uh, we have one more meeting. Northland. The Northland meeting is on the second Tuesday, Saturday. second Saturday, second Saturday. And we also have Eastern Kansas Real Estate Investors. They meet on Zoom, I believe, the fourth Monday. So check the Mary calendar out. Most of these are free or very low cost. So if you want more than this, because it's kind of uh, intimidating to network in a room with this many people. You're like, oh my God, I'm brand new here and there's 75 people I have to walk by. I don't want to do that. But you can go to one of these other meetings and there's 25 people. It's much more easy to get to know everybody a little bit at a time that way. And Winbusters has a new location. Waldo Cafe, 75th and Warnell. Yep. Yep. So they just moved two weeks ago. So we have uh, we have free rolls. So you walk in the door. <laughs> they, 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 they free food. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Awesome place you got there. They are really good. And I didn't get a chance. I was going to make all my volunteers to come up here and stand up, but I wanted to thank all of our volunteers that help out. If it were not for our volunteers, none of you would have a name tag on tonight. None of you would have gotten checked in. You would not be hearing a word I'm saying. We would have been showing this on the wall. We would not gotten it put together and it would not all get taken down and put back in my car. So I want to thank Holly, Jake, Bobby, Roland, Mark, Jean, and I think Kevin helped out pack enough last month on the screen. If he didn't, we're going to make it tonight. We, we to thank um, and you should always check it out Kim's out there Kim Donaway is the lady with the camera taking pictures <laughs> and um, I can tell you I've 
I, fa I found some really great pictures of everybody out there, and if you're ever looking for marketing social media photos, I think you could go grab it off the Mary website and uh, virtually remove your name tag and then use it for a marketing photo, because I've done that with a few of the pictures. I've <laughs> virtually removed my name tag and then put it on another background, and then I had a picture to use on social media. So we, we thank Kim for all of her photos she takes. So pose for her, she'll take even better photos. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm right at my time. I've gotten through everything. Okay, so uh, this is an informational meeting, and I want to give you a disclaimer because we've had some people get confused. This is an informational meeting to spark thought and ideas. We don't endorse anyone's strategy, person, model, or product, and we highly recommend consulting experts before buying, investing, hiring, or doing business. Sometimes when our speaker is an attorney, I don't believe Byron's an attorney, so this might not apply. But when our attorney, a speaker is an attorney, while they are attorneys, they are not your attorney. So remember that they're not acting on your behalf when they're answering your questions, unless you sign a document saying you're going to pay them. All right, how many people hate taxes? All right. William, you love them, right? Okay, they're there. you got to pay them. I don't like taxes. And I was at an event on Zoom. I went to a National RIA meeting on Zoom. And tonight's speaker was one of the speakers. His other, the other person was one of his daughters. And I, I, for the life of me, not sure which one was on the meeting. And I've been to a lot of tax saving classes, a lot in 20 years. And I was taking notes because he was saying stuff. Some of it I'd heard of, but forgotten about. You know how you're like, oh man, that's great, I'm going to write that down. And five years later, you're going, man, that's great. I learned that five years ago. Why didn't I do that? Or I did that. One of the things he's talking about, the Augusta rule, we did that when we had a second home. But I think I might be able to use that on my personal home. So I'm hoping he talks about that tonight. I really want to know. But he had other stuff I had never heard of in my life. And I've seen a lot of people talk about saving on your taxes. So I was like, they need to come speak at Mary. And then I go to National RIA's event in June, and there they were. Like, we would like to come out and speak. So this is the guy you want to talk to if you need a tax consultant. If you need a partner to go snow skiing with or anything dangerous, leave him at home. I understand he's a daredevil, so I hear. But I want to welcome him to the stage, Byron McBroom. Give him a warm welcome, warm give him a applause. What she forgot to mention is I have a superpower, okay? Oh, yes. And my, my superpower is I can't be killed. Okay, okay. yeah, that's true. He's, he's part cat. I've, I've uh, started at the beginning, I was robbed at gunpoint, then I got stabbed, and then I, uh, I drowned. Then I've been in an avalanche and uh, had a heart attack. And then I had two actually, because they didn't give me blood thinners when I checked out. And then, uh, and then I recently had a tree fall on me. Oh, I had that. <laughs> so I was up mountain biking up by, I live in California, Central California. And we were mountain biking and going along, and I was minding my own business, me and a bunch of my friends, and this massive tree decides to fall as I was going by. Wow. So it, it hit the front of my bike, crushed the front of the bike, it broke my neck, my back, broke my ribs, my sternum, I had bleeding in the brain, and it, uh, anyway, I laid there for a while. Luckily, I was with six of my friends, and so they went up and they uh, called an ambulance. It took like an hour or so to get there. Luckily, one of the guys that we met on the trail that day happened to be a nurse, so he made sure they mobilized me so they couldn't move me around and all that. And anyway, they had to stretch me out for a mile and a half, and then I got a helicopter, a $65,000 helicopter ride. Oh. Is that a write-off? That's what I was <laughs> well, they got it for health insurance because it cost me a whole hundred dollars for that helicopter ride. Wow. So, and the week before, I, I, was, uh, I was backpacking with my daughter, because I like to backpack a lot. And 
we were going up, but it was just raining. I always say raining like a cow pissing on a flat rock. You know, it's just really boring. You know, and the uh, I'm kind of inappropriate, so. <laughs> but the uh, it was just raining, raining. Lightning was going on, and I said, "Oh man, this is gonna hurt." I know I'm gonna live, but it's really gonna hurt. You know, if the lightning hits me. So, but anyway, I've actually recovered. My golf handicap has actually dropped two points since I broke my back. So all I could do for several months was chip. So I got really good at putting up there in one putt. So if anybody wants to improve their golf game, this is the tip. <laughs> but the reason I bring this story up is, is not just to tell a story, but how many times do people feel like this is your tax bill that falls out of the blue on April 14th, you get a call from your guy and you owe $50,000. I mean, that's just what you just don't want to hear. So what we want to do today is to give you some tips, tricks, you know, whatever we're going to do to give you how to minimize that tax bill, make it smaller or make it non-existent. Okay, so today we're going to cover some tax strategies, help you make that tree smaller or we'll chop it down. Okay, so I like to tell stories. Instead of just telling you what to do, I like to tell stories of what we did. So I had a client named Juan, and Juan was making some good money. He was a house flipper, making about a million dollars net. And, and he was uh, he was gonna owe $400,000 in tax, okay? Which is kind of painful. You know, you worked all that year, busting your butt, risking everything you own, and now you gotta pay $400, and who knows what they're gonna do with it. But anyway, you know. So he had, he had the cost of his home to support his in-laws. He had a daughter going to out-of-state tuition, plus he also supported his in-laws. And so he was, just felt like he was spending, it was going, even though he's making good money, it was going out as fast as he could make it. So, and he also had two kids, two kids at home. So what we did for one, we have what we call an eight-step process, okay? And we put him through our eight-step process, of which I'll cover for you, and we were able to save one $67,000 every year in permanent savings, and then we got him a tax, we have a tax deferral program I'll go over in a little bit, and he actually was able to save $1.4 million in tax over several years using this program. But it, and I want to talk about, okay, uh, there's a difference between permanent savings and deferral savings. The permanent savings is money that you never have to pay back, okay? Deferral savings is like putting money into, uh, it's like taking bonus depreciation, or depreciation when you sell it, you got to pay back the tax. So you always want to try to have permanent savings instead of deferral savings, but deferral savings aren't bad. Either. So in our eight-step process, what we did for one, so I said, okay, are you ready? Some of what I tell you is going to be like drinking out of a fire hose, okay? <laughs> so the, the first one, this is the most boring one, but it's basically having a good set of books. Because a lot of times people come and they want to reduce their taxes, but they haven't been doing their accounting, their books are way behind. <clears throat> How much did you make? Oh, I don't really know, you know. How much do you gross? They know that one usually, you know. But then how much do you net? And then, so it, it's really good to have a good set of books. And, and kind of what we recommend for that is to have, make sure you have, a, for some of you that are beginners, the, most people that are advanced do a lot of this already, but make sure you have a separate bank account, a separate credit card for your real estate investments. Because that way, if you just remember to use the right debit card or write a check out of the account, you're gonna get the tax deduction because you're gonna summarize that up. And if you throw it to something like QuickBooks, then, and you reconcile the accounts, it, it forces you to get every deduction that went through the account. So a good set of books will really, bookkeeping really is free when you consider how much taxes it saves you. So we talked about that. And, and I like to use software like Dext or with QuickBooks Online. In QuickBooks Online, there's a receipt capture thing where you can just take a picture of it and if you set it up right, it'll just flow into your QuickBooks. And you can click on the, click on the expense and the receipt pops up. So there's a lot of, a lot of technology, I don't want to cough in oh, Excuse me. Uh, there's a lot of technology you can take advantage of to pay less taxes too. So people, the step two on this thing is to make sure you have the right entity selection. So normally when you're buying and holding an LLC or just a, a, just a sole proprietor by yourself is the best. Uh, if you're flipping, you want to probably be, a, or wholesaling, you want to be an S corporation. And, and, and that really, when your net income is above 60,000, you want to be an S corporation. If you're flipping and it's going to be 30 or 40,000 profit, then just keep life simple. Don't, don't go into the S corporation because the cost 
it, it, it really breaks even about 50 to 60 and starts making you a profit when you get over 60. And principally, that's because you're saving what's called self, everybody familiar with self-employment tax? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's your social security tax, Medicare tax. Mm -hmm. Once you make over 147, that goes away, but on the first 147, you have to pay 12.4 for flip for social security and then 2.9 for Medicare. The, the thing about social security taxes that's kind of interesting is on the first 15,000 you make, 85% of the tax goes to your retirement account. So it's a pretty good investment. A lot of you, I always tell people if you're, if you have a non-working wife or spouse, a lot of times you might want to put them on the payroll for at least 15 to build up their social security retirement. That's a, a really good rate of return on the investment. Yeah, but but once you get, once, so if someone makes $150,000, they're paying $22,000 in self-employment tax. The beautiful thing about being an S-corporation is you can make the same 150, pay yourself a salary of say 60, and you only pay 9,000 instead of the 22,000. So it's a pretty good savings, but it's really in a, in a, that short window that you do save the savings. If you're gonna be an Airbnb, Airbnb is the same thing as flipping because it's considered ordinary income because it's short-term rentals. So you want to be an S corporation above the 60,000. And then if you're a regular business, the same rules. I would say S corporation above 60, LLC below that. And then if you're buying notes, it doesn't really matter because there's no liability with notes. So you don't have to worry about getting caught with liability, but there's also no self-employment tax. So the, just hold them as an individual is fine. Now, let's talk about what we did for one. Uh, one of the things we did was we lowered his officer salary. There's a thing called qualified business income. Is anybody familiar with that phrase? Okay. In 2018, when they passed the tax law, they made it so profits from your rentals, profits from a business, um, are only taxed at 80%. So if you made $100,000, you only have to pay tax on $80,000 of it. Okay. If you make W-2 wages, you have to pay tax on 100% of it. So, like I said, with profits, you'd only pay tax on 80,000. If it was W-2, you'd pay on 100,000. So what we did for Juan, he was paying himself 120,000. We lowered it to 60. And what that did was he saved uh, $9,000 in payroll taxes, because now he only pays the 15% on the 60 instead of the 120. And then he also, since he lowered it by 60, he got 20% of that 60 is tax free. So that was a $12,000 extra tax deduction times his tax bracket. Keep in mind my example is California, so we have higher taxes. But I like it because it shows that I'm more valuable. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that saved him an extra $4,000. So just a simple trick of lowering his salary by 60,000 bucks saved him $13,000 a year. And he gets the same amount of money. I mean, it's more, but. So take a look at the, the salary we did for him. The next thing we talked about, she mentioned the Augusta rule. But the Augusta rule is, is when they, they had the, the, the Augusta tournament in the, the U.S. Open in Augusta, Georgia. And so people would come into town and there wasn't enough hotels. So a lot of people started renting their home out, before, this was way before Airbnb, but they started renting their home out during the Augusta tournament. They'd go on vacation, they'd rent their home out for an absorbent amount. Well, the IRS said that you're really not in the trader business of renting your home if you're only doing it for the 14 days. So they made that 14 days tax free. So we twist this up a little bit. You know, you always got to look at it and say, how can I maneuver that around, okay? So what I do is I hold my corporate board meetings in my home. Once a month, I have a corporate board meeting and I rent my home. What's, what, if, what's a one day rental rate on a home if I was going to hold a wedding at it? You know? Well, it, it's higher than the normal, you know, you, people take the monthly rent and divide it by 30. No, it's, it's and, and now you have Airbnb to get a more comparable rate. But there, with, with my house, I do it for $1,000 a day. I think one was a little higher than that. He has a pretty nice house. But he got 19000 tax-free, which saved him 9600 in tax. Now, you have to be a corporation for doing this or a, a LLC that's a partnership. A single-member LLC can't do this. And you have to have a separate office outside the home. So there are a few things you have to do to make sure you get your T's crossed and I's dotted. But this is just for swapping checks with yourself. So it, it, it's a pretty good thing. One had two kids under 18. How many of you have kids under 18? Okay. So a child now can make $13,850 and not pay a penny in tax on it. And if, there's, if you're a sole proprietor or single member LLC, 
you can pay them and don't have to pay payroll taxes on it. And then they can, you can put that in a Roth IRA, you can buy a, a whole life policy for them and they'll be set for life. There's a lot of things you can do with that money, uh, but the, it's, just a, it's just a giveaway. Now it has to be, there's a court case that came out on it, and it has to be reasonable work for reasonable pay. Okay, you, I, I had a guy with a 10 year old, I said, what does he do for you? Well, he does all the office filings and he does the data entry. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and the test we use for any deduction is can you look an otter in the eye and not smile when you tell them the story, okay? You know, is it believable? So what we do is we hire the kids as models. I mean, how many of you have businesses that you do any advertising or you do Facebook or Instagram? The government maybe made $60,000 a year. So, and the, the court case that came out said you have to keep records, you have to be paid a reasonable wage. Well, modeling, is what's great about this is because normally you give a kid a job and he's, you're gonna make 13 or 14, whatever minimum wage is. But models make 125 and 175 an hour with a two to three hour minimum. So you just have to write up a little modeling agreement and then they have to do a photo, you know, Photoshop or two a month, photo set a month, and you've got them up to the 13 or 14,000, they could be a two year old. That'd be what? <laughs> Some of you might not have got beta models, but not you guys, but you know. But, but the, uh, this is just a great thing, and, and with the money you can, you know, you can use it for their clothes, you can pay, you know, put an IRA, fund their future for them. Uh, I have one client, he's a pretty clever guy, he, he does a lot of wholesaling, and he makes about two million a year doing this, so he's pretty good at it. And what he did is he, he has Roth IRAs, and what he does with the Roth IRAs is he, he, he buys the, ties down the property, and then he sells that right to the property, and he wholesales it to somebody else. He does this with his kids' Roth IRAs. So he has himself, he has his wife, he has two kids, and they do five properties a year apiece, so he makes $500,000 a year tax-free doing this. Wow. That a slick deal? Never pay tax on them, ever? Wow. Um, but it, it starts with him paying them a wage, and then they fund their Roth IRAs and build the Roth IRAs up. So now you have to file forms, you have to file payroll forms, there's no tax due on it, but you got to file. you got to keep a log on what the hours they work on and, and pay them accordingly. A lot of people just want to pay them at the end of the year, and the IRS frowns on that. They also frown on you paying them exactly $13,850. You know? And then you have to file a return in most states. I don't know what it is for this state. I should have looked it up. But uh, California, it's anything over 4,300 bucks. But I don't know what it is here. But there are things you have to do. So you might, you might, you know, save this 13, you might spend a thousand. Because you got to file returns for the kids, plus the payroll returns. So, but it's, it's really a heck of a deal. And it, and you can do this with grandkids too. There's a way to do it with the grandkids. If you pay them directly, you have to pay payroll tax on it. So you got to pay the parents, they pay the kids. We teach you how to shuffle it all around. This is our ebb tide lowers all boats, okay? We have a lot of different names for this one. I'll go over in a little bit how we use it. But, but this is, is you take a peek at everyone around you and say, okay, who's got the low tax bracket I can take advantage of? I'll give you an example on, on Juan here. He was supporting his in-laws anyway. So what we did is we formed a corporation owned by the, by the in-laws it performed a service for the company. They were just passive owners of the company. They didn't do anything. He did all the work. And then we basically paid that company a profit of $70,000 on top of the expenses. And that lowered his tax 29000 bucks. So when he gives them the money, he just gives it to them out of that corporation because they're just taking a dividend from the corporation. I do this with my own mom and have been doing it for years. Last year, I paid my mom $84,000. I mean, I give her 1500 bucks a month anyway. So she just takes it out of that, I pay her taxes out of that, and then she just gives the rest of it back to me. So, and the beautiful thing is, is I'm the golden son, but the IRS is paying for it, okay? So, uh, we have a couple other ways you can do this. Uh, we, uh, we have the baby mama plan, okay? When you, when you have people that are living in sin, the sinners and everything, you, and you have one that, is making a lot of money and the other one might not be. That way you can shift in and come to the same people in the same household. We call that one the fornicator plan. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
But this this M type plan is a great deal. With all of these, there's rules you got to follow. So a lot of times when we do onboarding for people, we always go through and set them up, give them a list of things that they have to do, and either you guys do it or we do it for you. Um, but for one, in addition to paying his mom, this is great for kids in college. Uh, he had a daughter that was going to out-of-state school in Arizona, and they were in California. And so we had her form her own separate corporation. Her W-2 came from that corporation for half of it, and then she got the other half in a profit distribution. And by the daughter going there and having her own source of income, she was able to show that she was financially independent. So within a year, she qualified for in-state tuition instead of being out of state for four years. So that saved them a bunch of money on tuition. The beautiful thing is when your child comes home to visit you, she's coming to see her customer. So it's tax deductible. And when you're going to see them at school, it's tax deductible because you're going to see a vendor. So it just, I had a client who was doing this in Hawaii and he just loved it, you know. So we call this our college plan. And I'm sad because I figured this out after I spent my $300,000 putting my kids to school. So I'm, I'm sad about my timing. It wasn't really the best. Okay, this is a picture of me. And I was flying out to speak somewhere and my hair was just looking shaggy. So I gave myself a haircut. Okay? <laughs> I'm doing the back and I'm thinking I'm looking good because I look good in the front, you know, and I'm doing the back, but I ain't got much anyway. But so I did this and I go to work because my flame didn't leave and my daughter comes in and just starts laughing and saying, Dad, did you cut your own hair? Okay. And I said, yeah. And so she said, well, you. So anyway, I had to go back to the barber. This is the barber took this and he patched it up for me. But um, a lot of times you hear strategies like this and you want to, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers. And this is the do-it-yourself gone wrong. And, and I just want to warn you, some of these things, there's rules to follow. There's court cases that we follow that there's, Really, you have to lay it out a certain way, or you can get yourself in trouble. So, gotta laugh at yourself. Um, so, those are those are all called permanent strategies. Okay, I talked about permanent savings because when you do those, you don't have to pay the money back. Now, I'm going to talk about a deferral strategy that you can use, and we do this with a lot of a lot of our businesses that have a lot of payroll on it, or if you're somebody that does flipping. You can have an acquisition company than a repair company, how this can work. But basically, what we do is this is how you get an interest-free loan from the government. So this up here is your, where's my little button here? At the top company is your main company. That's the company that's doing your wholesaling, that's doing your flipping, it's doing, or if you have, how many of you have just regular businesses too, okay? So this is your main company. And then what happens is with your support company, we, f we always like to look and see what kind of service we can put in there, and we customize it for people, but the normal example is we put your payroll. In my example, I'll use a guy with a million dollars of payroll. So he has his support company, he pays his, out of the support company, we shift all your employees to that, and he pays his payroll out through the year. Well, he takes, he puts money in to pay that payroll, and he invoices the main company, but the main company is just a terrible customer. Okay, terrible customer. They don't pay their bills on time. Okay, so they but they do end up paying them. So the they get around to paying them. One of the things I forgot to mention is that my oh, uh -oh. Oh. I got a laser pointer or somewhere. But in the middle. The, in the middle. All right. <laughs> so this company has a December year in, and most people aren't aware of this, but you can have actually have an S corporation with a November year in. There's just some elections and stuff you have to do. But since this guy pays him the money in the month of December, it's tax deductible up here, but it's not taxable down here. So we take a guy with a million dollars of payroll, we look up, we do a lot of stuff with industry averages, so we mark it up based on what everybody else marks up payroll, which is 40%, and then we charge the main company $1.4 million. And so then he pays in December, so this guy gets a million for deduction, and this guy, doesn't have to pay tax on it for a whole year. Let me just do it again, do it again, and do it again. But what makes this really cool, okay, I gave you the cupcake with the frosting on it, now I'm gonna give you the sprinkles, okay? With well, As a cash basis taxpayer, you're allowed to prepay a whole year fees in advance. So 
this guy with a million dollars in payroll can really get a $2.8 million tax deduction with no cash. So really, now in California, that would give me $1.4 million in working capital. And Juan did this, we did this for Juan. He started doing this in 2010 and took that money and bought real estate. Think how well you'd have done with a million and a half dollars of cash starting in 2010 buying real estate with what he's done since then. Uh, we did a financial statement for him because he was getting a divorce. Okay. <laughs> and he had about 12 or 13, 14 million dollars in real estate now. But, and, and some of that was his own money because he made a lot of money. But a lot of it was done with IRS's money that he hasn't even paid back yet. So it's, it's just a way to get more working capital to fund your dreams, you know. Um, this, we call this the kick the can plan. The other name for it is the crack cocaine plan. Okay. <laughs> and we call it that because it's fun and addictive, but at some point in time you have to go into rehab because you got to pay the money back, okay? So, but anyway, he spent it over several years and, and he had that money. And one of the things we like with this is we actually like people to buy a, a, a life policy when they do this plan because if you pass away in the middle of this, you leave your wife or spouse with a big burden. Now, maybe you want to, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that way, if, if something happens in the middle of all this, you can, you know, you can have that paid off and it's not a burden to your wife or spouse. I get politically correct. <laughs> But this program is a really good way to, and, and you, you just have to customize how it's done. For somebody that does a lot of flipping, you know, they, they have an acquisition company and they have a, a repair company, or the, you know, does all the different marketing company and whatever you do, you just have to customize it so it works. How many of you have ever had to sell something and had a massive capital gain? It was just terrible, right? It was depressing. You work so hard. Well, what I'm going to talk about now, we call them our hangover pills, um, and we're going to show you how to avoid or delay capital gains significantly. So the first one here, you have to do before the listing, before you put it up for sale. That's called a charitable LLC. And then during the listing, after the listing, but during before the sale, you can do what we call a deferred escrow trust. And then afterwards, you can do a charitable, like your own private foundation with a charitable league trust, but you can also do syndications, and you more of you are familiar with syndications, where you can buy and they take the bonus depreciation. Um, so let me kind of go over what they do. I had a client who was selling their business for $6 million. The tax would have been $2.2 .2 million. What we did is we, you, you, you basically form an LLC, you make it a 1% manager who has the control, a 99% member, and then you put a percentage of your property into this right before you put it up for sale. In this case, he put 40% of his $6 million business into the, into the LLC. And then what you do is you donate that 99% interest to a 501c3 nonprofit before you sell it. And then, and then the LLC sells the business. So what happens is, Nonprofits don't pay capital gains tax. So with this for in this example, I don't know if I put my example in here. I did not. In this example, by doing that, he, he only paid capital gains on 3.6 million instead of the 6 million, but he also got a charitable contribution for the 2.4 million. And the capital gains was taxed the capital gains rates, but the charitable contributions offset ordinary income rates combination of both of those actually got him down to $128,000, over $2 million savings on this one transaction. So how you can use this to your advantage, how many have been out there trying to buy a property and they won't sell it because they gotta pay tax? So what you can do is if you could structure, if, if you could say to people, if I could, if you're a realtor, I'm, if I could have you not pay capital gains tax, would you list it with me? <laughs> or would you sell me that property if I could show you how to not pay the capital gains tax? So I've done a, couple, a few of these, and this is really a very powerful deal. What happens with the money is the money sits in the LLC until you pass away, and then it goes to the charity. But you have the use of that money until you pass away. You can also set it up so it goes to them when your kids die, so you can make that thing 50 or 60 or 70 years out. And sometimes we have people buy a life policy for the amount that they put in the LLC, so their family gets the same amount of money when they pass away. 
So there's lots of strategies you can do with this to make it so your family gets saved. They just never end up paying the tax. I don't have a fancy name for that. I got to think about that. Um, let me talk for a second too on the deferred. All the deferred escrow trust does is you you basically form a trust. Has to have an independent trustee. Everybody know what the installment sale is? You know when you sell somebody a carry paper. Well, when you when you do that, you only pay tax as they pay you principal on the loan. So what we do is we form a trust. We sell it to the trust on the installment sale, interest only for 30 years, 30 year balloon. So we really effectively can delay the capital gains up to up to 30 years. I ran numbers on a three million dollar capital gain, and it was only equivalent to like $300,000 if you'd waited for 30 years with inflation. Probably less than that now, but. <laughs> That's not uh, about that. So at the end of the day, it, it doesn't go to your, the people inherited it goes to the, ch the charity, right? On the charity one, what's in the charitable trust goes to the charity when you pass away. The other part goes to you. What other part? The, like on that example, I put 40% into the LLC and 60% went to him individually. So, so is a 40% tax then? No, the 40% is not tax. You don't pay tax on it, plus you get a capital, you get a charitable contribution deduction for it. But that goes to your heirs, you're saying 40%. No, the 60% goes to your heirs. Okay, so you pay tax on the 60%. Right. Okay, okay. But the charitable contribution offsets it. Are you allowed to own the charity? Yeah. No. Must be a 501c. There's some funky rules. That it takes a lot of the one contributor can only donate thirty three percent to the corporation to the nonprofit. Otherwise, it turns it into a private foundation, and the rules change on this. So now that would be a real sweet deal, and you can get a job from the, the nonprofit. <laughs> but the, the the deferred escrow, all it does is delay the tax. It doesn't get rid of it. But but think of it: if you have a big sale, say you have a two million dollar sale, you know capital gains start out at fifteen percent, then they go to twenty. Then you have, if it's over 250, you have what's called net investment income tax, which is another 3.8. So it's really 24 plus your state taxes. And if if you get that in small doses, one, the 20% the drops to 15, so you save five right off the top. And then it also makes it so you don't pay the net tax, the 3.8%. So just by spreading it into a couple of years, you save 9% of that, you know, almost 40% of that tax just by spreading it out over three years. That deferred escrow is a really good thing to use in lieu of a 1031. Because a lot of times you buy a 1031 and you, you gotta buy it, you gotta identify within 45 days and close within 180 days. And you think the market's about to collapse or you want to time the market or you don't have that much time or there's no properties out there or you, so you gotta buy a piece of property you don't really want. By doing that deferred escrow, we had a guy with a $19 million sale. His biz tax was gonna be 5.5 million. We got it down to 450,000 with a combination of these two strategies. And his plan was to go out and buy 12 or $15 million worth of real estate anyway. So what we did is we did the deferred escrow trust. And then basically what he would go out and buy a property. And then as he would get properties and take the bonus depreciation, he would pay down his principal to wipe out the, the bonus depreciation. And that way he could just basically get this back. And it was like a, a 1031 that went on for three or four years. I'm sorry, can I ask one more question? Does the charity deduction hit the personal return or the LLC return? Does the what now? The charitable deduction, does it hit the Goes to your personal. Personal? Yeah. So, and then, and then if, if you can possibly make it when you're doing these installment sales, if you if someone's gonna sell and they're, let's say it's an older couple you're buying a piece of property from, this is gonna be their only income, so they don't mind, but you can, you can make this an installment, they can make an installment sale, keep their income down below $80,000 a year and you pay zero capital gains tax. So you could have someone with a million dollar sale, feather it into them for over 12 or 13, 14 years, and then they would pay zero tax on that whole sale. So there's just a lot of options for people to work with. And you know, my job is to give you a smorgasbord boring and if you don't like to eat the shrimp, you don't have to, you know. <laughs> I got a little joke for you. What do an accountant use for birth control? Their personality. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a great tax plan, okay? 
Yeah. One of you, one of you, if you're a married couple, one of you has to go along with it, though. So, but consider when you have appreciated property and your parent, my parent, my mom's ninety, so I'm looking at putting some appreciated property in a mom's name, and then when she passes, I'll inherit it back. So let's say I have a, a, a three million dollar piece of property. I bought it for four hundred thousand dollars. Depreciated the heck out of it. Now its basis is next to nothing. I can give that to my mom, and then I can inherit it back with a step up of basis of three million. So when I sell, there's no tax to pay, or I can redepreciate it. How does that does that take into consideration if they have any long term care or anything? That you'd have to talk to an elder or law attorney on that one. But I think with some of that long term care, California just passed the thing. If it was in a living trust, it doesn't hurt for that. But I would definitely talk to your, the, have those considerations. You also have to make sure your siblings get the joke, <laughs> you know, and make sure the will is written up and ironclad. And, and by all means, make sure you have a will and a, a living trust. I had a client die. He was 29 years old. <coughs> he had a business with his father. The father kept giving him more of the business, giving him more of the business. Years before the father went through a divorce, and it was a, a bitter divorce. It was one where he took the mattress out and burned it in front of the children bitter, okay? <laughs> so a bitter divorce, but when someone dies in California without a will, the property gets split between uh, the, the dad and the mom. So now he's been giving this kid all these portions of his business worth millions of dollars. The kid dies without a will, and now half of his estate goes to his ex-wife that he has to buy back now for another bitter, bitter. So, wills and living trusts, firm believer in that. But, but this gives the people up a step in basis. You can have them do it when one spot, before one dies, and you can have it all gifted to you at the first passing. Um, you just gotta make sure everything's written up. It's, this is really good plan if you're an only child and your parents still like you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so for what Juan did, Juan basically took his deferral money, funded a real estate portfolio. We actually put a, a, a cash life value policy together so he was secured. That way he could always borrow from the policy to make it so that he could, you know, he did some his own personal banking. And one of the things that people don't really get with life insurance <laughs> is kind of like a massive Roth with no limits because the money grows tax free. You never pull it out. If you pull it out, it's taxable. But if you wait and take it out of death, it's never taxable. So it's kind of like a, a, a big Roth IRA you can do for yourself that does have some advantages. I wish they had it where you could do it like a self-directed IRA and a self-directed insurance policy, but they don't have that. So, But anyway, this one basically took his money and bought a whole bunch of real estate. I mentioned already before what he did. But it just really launched him because having that much cash to buy properties with back then was pretty powerful. So how would an extra $67,000 a year in savings plus an interest loan that affect your life? It'd be pretty significant, wouldn't it? Now, everybody always says, Byron, you got all these large numbers, those don't really apply to me. You know? So what if you could just save 6,500 a year from a couple things? It doesn't sound that big, but if you invested it over 20 years, 6,500 every year, and got just 5% on it, that turns into, 6,500 turns into 231,000. Mm. You know, it's just the compound value of money. Now, if you just save the 6,500 and get nicer tennis shoes, <laughs> you know, then you'll just have a lot of nice, you don't even have tennis shoes, it won't last. But this is how much it, it puts away. The time value of money is so incredibly powerful. <laughs> and this, he, he, he did that without, you know, he didn't have to increase his income to save, he didn't have to reduce his expenses. Then have to grow his business, then have to change his lifestyle. That's just strictly from the tax savings. <coughs> so my daughter was a skydiver. Usually I present this speech with my daughter, and she's a lot younger and better looking than me. <laughs> but, but she used to be a skydiver. And so she goes up and she takes her skydiving classes. I think it's genetic, so. Um, she <laughs> takes her skydiving classes. When she taught the class, she, you know, they have you jump out, and as soon as you pull your chute, the, the guy pulls his pin and gets away from you. Well, she kind of noticed that everybody had, after the fact, she looked around and noticed everybody's wearing gloves, because they dropped me off at 14,000 feet. 
and they never told her not to, to get gloves. So she goes up there, she pulls her chute, something because her hands were feel, frozen and she couldn't feel her chute malfunction, malfunction. Started twisting up to kind of look like this. Her first jump and she's just free falling. Wow. You know? And so they teach you when you're taking skydiving school, you know, you get a swing set, you twist your legs and twist your legs. Well, she actually remembered it, mm -hmm. you know, which was pretty amazing, but she actually got her chute to open up, floated down and everything was okay. But the, the moral of the story is, make sure you know your guide, you know, make sure when you talk to someone, are they, most CPAs, present company excluded, okay, they just ask you questions to fill out the forms. You want someone that's going to be proactive and ask you questions on how to save money. That's the keys. Are they asking you the right questions? Um, so with this, it was the gloves, and uh, she's got a different story on the lost friend. Oh, this was a guy that came to us years ago. We showed he was an attorney. He made just a ton of money. We showed I think it was ninety-one thousand dollars a year or something. He was going to save plus some. It was a lot. And anyway, he said, oh, my CPA is my friend. You know, I don't feel comfortable. So then anyway, he calls us about a year or two later and says, I need to come talk to you. And he's presented me with a $300,000 bill on April 14th, and now he's no longer my friend. <laughs> um, so you just want someone that's going to be proud. So we have two things for you. One, we offer a free assessment for anybody. We actually have a website called taxsavingsestimator.com that you can plug in and see how much you're leaving on the table. And uh, that's free. We also offer a free, a free assessment where you call us up, we'll ask you 20, 25 questions, and then we'll tell you what you're leaving on the table. We also have a program we've done for you guys, which is called Tax Essential Course, and we give that away free. And what it is, is, is uh, we have a whole bunch of videos that I've done, because every business, they have the same questions, okay? How do I write off my car? How do I write off my meals? How do I write off my travel? How do I write off all these things? What we did is we put them into a video series that you guys can all watch, and it's free. And then at the same time, what I do is I hop on quarterly, and I stay there for an hour, and anybody can ask unlimited questions, and it's all for free. Anyway, thanks for having me. Is there any questions I can answer? And I've told you an awful lot of information. On the life insurance, is it an IUL or is it a whole life? Either one. Is it a term? Does it matter? You can Let do. me bring the mic to you guys. You can do term. The question was, is, does it matter what type of life insurance? It, it really depends on what your needs and goals are. Some people just want terms. They want to invest the rest. Some people want, want a, a whole life that builds up and you can borrow from it for future investments. It really depends on what your individual needs are. And what your plans are is what yeah. you want to do with the money. But I know that they've been swaying back and forth between an IUL and the whole life. There's been a lot of shifting the last couple of years. Well, you have to be kind of careful with 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 life insurance because this is something you always you know when you when you when you build a house you get a second opinion you get a couple bids right. When you get sick, you can see a couple doctors right. Nobody ever gets a second opinion on taxes, and a lot of times they don't get a second opinion on insurance, okay? But with insurance, you have to be really careful because you can write up a policy to give you more cash flow or give you more death benefit. And here's the problem is the agent makes a lot more money when it's got death benefit. So it, we did one numbers, and, and, and most, most, a lot of insurance companies will teach people they don't tell them the way to have lower commissions, you know. So you just want to have that second opinion and say, it's just maximizing my cash flow. And it would really depend on what your needs are. Do you want cash flow? Do you want cash surrender value building up? Or do you want the life? A lot of times I'm a recommender of doing as little life as possible, and then you fund it as maximum as much, because then it builds up so much cash that you have as a bank. It, it, the, you then the you can out. take the money out and borrow from it, and it still makes money, but you can then invest it. So I'm a, more of a part of that, but we, my daughter did one deal and the commissions were like half, you know? So you just really want to make sure, and, and if you just ask them to give you that and then you get a second opinion, you'll see if that person has your back or not. <laughs>
you know, because it, it, it depends on what your goals are. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need more death benefit. It depends on what your goals are. So, and everything, get a second, get a second opinion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And your taxes. You said you, most people don't get a second opinion on their taxes. They just... They just get them done the and they bite the bullet and bite their lip till it bleeds. I was at a wedding uh, last week. It was a Greek wedding. It was pretty fun. Okay. And the, 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 father of the, daughter, the father of the bride gets up there and the women in his family, I think, are pretty bossy. I, I kind of got that opinion. <laughs> and his toast, he said, son, you just got to learn with the women of the so-and-so family, you just got to bite your lip till it bleeds. Well, that's what you want to hear as a young group. <laughs> but that's what most people do with their taxes. They just, and most, most accountants will just say, well, you can do an IRA or buy a car. You know? So look for one that will ask you questions on how to save money. That's what you should be looking for. Okay, so these, these, many of your, your things on the pie there are exceedingly clever. Paying your, paying your baby to be a model, uh, renting out your house for, for, for corporate meetings, you know, forming all these various entities under your master and to perform services for each other. So if you sit down with an auditor, is there a cumulative effect of these clever strategies that are going to cause them to you know have a hard time taking you seriously well we've been audited three times on my kick to camp plan and on the second one the guy says i can see what you're doing here this guy's making a lot more money you know and he's not having to pay the tax we won anyway but the, the key in all these things is you have to have a substantial business purpose the kids actually have to do the work you can't just pay them the money and then they don't there's no you need to show them your Facebook and Instagram posts to see that the, the pictures were taken and you have to do the actual work. Uh, the, the nice thing why I like to use advertising for like the College Corp or the Kick the Can plan is how many people's 19 year old kids are better at Instagram and Facebook than they are? They don't use Facebook anymore, but that's for old people. You know? <laughs> but they're better at this stuff than you are anyway. So it's very believable. And my son, my son was a, I call him an Instagram douchebag, okay? <laughs> you know, you know that, he loved all that stuff. Shoot me if you heard me say that. <laughs> but he got it, I paid for him with consultants, so he got up to a million followers on Instagram. It's a lot. Now, I think 900,000 of them were from Afghanistan or Pakistan. <laughs> but he had a lot of followers. Uh, and we got a lot of clients from it. A lot of clients from it. But there was consultants that we paid five hundred dollars a month for. There was consultants we paid five thousand a month for. At the end, well, he left to start his own practice. But at the end, he was had money he paid thirteen thousand a month because the guy got him from a half million to a million followers. That's where all the people from Pakistan came from. But he just wanted to show that he had a million followers, you know. Uh, but so there's that's why I like advertising for of that that support company because. What, what does a person do? It's all labor, you know. There was actually a court case we just found for some medical doctors that did these three support companies and they lost their butts on it because they were just paying the exact same bills. They were, they would spend 200,000 advertising they were working it up like three times. So they were paying like $700,000 when they only had 200 of expenses. When we do stuff like this, we mark up everything with industry averages. We always look up and see what's an advertising agency's cost of goods sold. And we mark it up to reasonable amounts. I always say pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Yeah. You know, we just want to get chubby. You know. But everything has to have a valid business purpose. You have to have you have to actually have activity that matches what you're doing. If you don't, they'll throw it out. You know. Um, but how many people do anybody know what the average audit rate is? For for a sole proprietor, it's three point two percent. For somebody with an S corporation or a partnership, it's only 0.4%. So it's four out of a thousand. It's pretty small, you know? So if you couple that with doing things right, which is the only thing I advocate, I'm not out here to help you commit fraud or shower with your underpants on later or anything like that, you know? We want to do things right and we want to follow the rules. We don't make the rules up, we just, info we just make you follow them. And we've had people that want to do it differently. We just say, well, we can't help you anymore. 
You got to follow the rules. There's things you got to do, and you got to do it right. And if you do it right, you'll win. If you do it wrong, you'll lose. Yep. The Augusta rule I had a court case on that, and I've had clients in audits that lost the Augusta rule because they would just write one check at the end of the year, or they'd want to just do a journal entry and take it out of distributions, and then they didn't have any minutes for the meetings, yeah. and they couldn't prove anything. Well, they they lose it every time. But if you write that check every month and you have a meeting and actually do the meeting and have substantiation that you did it, you win. So it's, it's, it's doing things the right way, having that good set of books. The first thing I talked about is really, really powerful. And just, and, and, and just, some people don't like to do this stuff and we sometimes won't even, like the kick the can plan if they're not a saver, if they're a spender, if people are spenders or savers, if they're spenders, I won't even offer it to them because they'll just waste it. And then they owe a million dollars in tax. You know? So, any more questions? Would it, be, would it be fair to say that if your documentation is not correctly, you will, it's not done correct, you will fail an audit? No. Really? What causes an audit is on every one of your returns, like if you have a Schedule C, it says, there's a code up there that says your business code. And what they do is they compare your your numbers to everybody else that has the same revenues on those numbers. And if something is different from that, that's what they trigger out and then they they call it, they, they do what's called a review. So they pull it in and then they flip through the return and they look at it. What we do, our software spits that out. So we always review that when we review a tax return and then we either move stuff around or if we can't move it around, we actually attach the proof to the return for the, for the we put an explanation in there and we attach the receipts to the return to prove it. Because that way they'll flip through it and they'll pull it for audit. Oh, they say, oh, okay, this makes sense. And they put it back in the pile, you don't get audited. So our audit rate is actually half the national average for that reason, because we get proactive on it. So, so you want to work with somebody that knows how to do this, not just try to wing it with somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Well, you just, you, you want to work with the people that are trying to save you money and keep you out of trouble. We always say our goal is to have you pay as little tax as legally possible and stay out of trouble with a big emphasis on stay out of trouble. You know, it's just not worth it. Any more questions? Thank you for flying in. And I, I'm sure he will take some uh, questions because I know a lot of people have tax questions. They don't want to blur it out to the whole entire mm -hmm. room. So come on up, and he is here for uh, the rest of the evening.